So I spent, I spent four long years during my educational process and lots of semesters and lots of nights studying the Greek New Testament, learning how to translate. I brought along my handy-dandy Greek New Testament. It's next to my desk. It's a regular reference for me and looking at words, looking at sentences, looking at the details of God's Word. And if you're going to if you're going to learn to translate the Greek New Testament, everybody's going to start probably in the same spot, and that's going to be in the Gospel of John. And the reason you start learning to translate Greek New Testament in the Gospel of John is because there's a limited vocabulary. He doesn't use a ton of words. It's a, it's a tight vocabulary. It's simple phrases. It's simple sentence structure. If you look at a book like the book of Hebrews... It has a ton of unique vocabulary words, complicated sentence structures. It's just a different world when you get to Hebrews, and you're going to get there last. But the Gospel of John is simple, and that's why you start with this book. There are complicated things in the Bible. Uh, we know Knowing God, understanding God's will for your life, what He expects from us, His plan for the world, your life, is a complicated story. But John's focus is simple. And he told us, and we have repeated this uh, throughout the series, he said, this is why I wrote the gospel. John 20, 31 says, these things are written that you may believe, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. It, it's a clear purpose. It's a simple purpose. And he's going to take us there as quickly and simply as possible. Everything that he says just builds toward the goal that we may believe. Now, today, I'm going to share from a couple of chapters in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, chapter 8. And the reason is, I'm not going to be here for the next couple of weeks, so I need to unload a lot on you before I leave town. So you're going to get a whole lot of John today. Uh, next Sunday, Lord willing, I'll be uh, sharing on the Mount of Beatitudes next to the Sea of Galilee. How cool is that? And uh, I'll probably preach something from the Sermon on the Mount. Doesn't that seem about right? Just I'm thinking that's the way I'm going to go because I'm that kind of creative guy. So, uh, John 7. Now, two, last week we had a guest speaker. Two weeks ago we were in John chapter 6. John tap, chapter 6 tells the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And, it's, uh, and Jesus comes out. He's, I am the bread of life. So he makes a big application. Everything else in the long chapter 6 flows out of that. So today, chapter 7, chapter 8, we'll, we'll just have one verse out of chapter 8 uh, because there's so many other things we're, we're going to touch on later on. And I'll leave those to Jimmy Smith in the weeks, a couple, next couple of weeks. But John chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, says this. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. Uh, he would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. That's a good reason not to go to Judea. And verse 2 is important, and we'll come back to this. Now, the Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. Some of your translations will say Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Feast of Shelters, Feast of Booths. It was one of the big national feast days that brought people to Jerusalem. And uh, that context provides everything we need for 7 and uh, what I'll touch on in chapter 8. So you have, in chapter 6... You have uh, feeding of the 5,000, bread of life. Then, verse 1 of chapter 7 says, After these things, Jesus is still teaching around a Galilee, still in the northern part of the country. Judea is where Jerusalem is, and there are a lot of people there that want to kill him. And so he's staying up in the north, first two years of his public ministry, mostly in the north, um, although he'll come down for the feast days, which as a Jewish man, he was expected to come down for the feast days. And then verse 2. Verse 2 gives us a great hint. About six months have passed since he fed the 5,000. Now it's September, October time frame. And he's headed toward Jerusalem because it's one of the major feast days. And a lot of people have Jesus on their mind, though not in a good way. I want to run through this. If you have your Bible open, chapter 7, we're going to just touch on several verses. 
about what are people saying about Jesus? How are they responding to Jesus? What do people think about Jesus? Here's the first one, verse 3. It says, his brothers. Remember, Jesus, Jesus is born of a virgin. But then Mary and Joseph had other sons, and the Bible says also daughters. And his brothers, who were with him up in Galilee, they've been seeing the things he's doing, and they say, big brother, what you waiting for? Go down to Jerusalem, make yourself known. We would be glad to be a public relations firm representing you in your ministry. In verse 12, people are talking about Jesus, and some said, Jesus is a good man, and some said Jesus is a deceiver. In verse 15, Jesus goes up to the feast in Jerusalem. He starts teaching, and people say, who does this guy think he is? And where does he even come from? He's saying all this stuff. He's not one of our authoritative, established teachers that come through the system and that are recognized. Where is he getting this stuff? Verse 20, they accuse Jesus of being demon-possessed. You can criticize people in a lot of different ways. But when you accuse someone of being demon-possessed, maybe you do need a PR team. Verse 25, people begin to wonder. Verse 25 is interesting. People say, okay, so if the Messiah did come, would he do anything differently than what we're seeing? I mean, what, isn't, this, isn't this how he would go about his business, uh, doing the kind of things? Why is he not, why, why would we not think he is the promised one of God, the Messiah? And Jesus says, you're looking for the Messiah, but you are not finding him. You, I'm right here, and you're still missing me. Verse 40, opinions are divided again. And some people, they love Jesus. And some people, we talked about this a few weeks ago, they want to redefine Jesus. And then there's a core group of religious leaders in Jerusalem. They just want to kill Jesus. And then, in the middle of all that, we get verse 37 and 38. John chapter 7, verse 37 says, On the last day of the feast, the great day. Now that little notation is important. The great day. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Wow, that's a great image of dry land. The image of water saturates the gospel. How do you see how I did that? Make note of that. It flows through the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Keep our image of water going. We find Jesus is baptized in water, turns water into wine, walks on the water. There's a lot of water that happens in Jesus' ministry. And a lot of that's going to come from those Old Testament stories because water is scarce in the land of Israel. And that image and how God illustrates the water of life uh, shows up again and again. So, Old Testament, we might as well start in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And in the story where God gives birth to the creation, he brings shape and he brings order to the watery chaos. And this is an important starting point for the ancient Israelites because water held a lot of diverse meanings for them. Water is the source of life. It's a place of danger. Oh, and they, well, the psalmists love to grab that image because they'll talk about the ocean because the the, the Jewish people were not a seafaring people in a big way. They got on the Sea of Galilee, but they stayed away from the Mediterranean. The sea was a place of mystery, a place of danger, a place forbidding. A place of danger. Water's a, water represents cleansing. It represents renewal. And whether, whether God is separating uh, in the creation stories the the water from the land or the watery chaos, he brings order. He is authoritative over the waters. Then, in Genesis, we don't have to go very many chapters till we get the flood account, right? This time, God uses the waters to bring judgment against sin and sinners. He floods the world. Forty days and forty nights it rains, and the waters burst up from the ground, flood the whole earth. But then as the waters recede... 
there's a newness and there's a renewed commitment of God to covenant with his people as he calls them in a renewed covenant to him. And the rainbow in the sky declares God will never again destroy the water, destroy the earth, judge the earth by flood. Chaos and order, death and rebirth. And those themes uh, go all the way into the Gospels. So Jesus began his ministry. He steps into the Jordan River. John says, I am not the guy to baptize you. You ought to be baptizing me. This is John the baptizer, not John the apostle that wrote this book. But yet he, he submits to Jesus' request. And Jesus, it's a great symbol. Jesus uh, entering the chaos that water brings to the story of the world. He enters and brings order to the story and meaning to the story. He enters the waters himself. And we see Jesus in his humanity, uh, submissive to the Father as he enters the waters of baptism. And we see Jesus in his divinity because he still controls the waters. So he calms a stormy sea of Galilee and he walks on the water, turns water into wine, all those stories. And it is Jesus again. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And this is Jesus. Just as he transformed the water into wine to meet a need, Jesus sheds his own blood. And his blood shed at the cross becomes the river of living water that leads all the way to eternal life. And so you see that symbol as it moves through God's word. Now, the scarcity of water in the Bible lands is especially appreciated by the people there. We used to turn on a tap, and water's always available. Not so with, with these biblical people, Old Testament, New Testament. Water's hard to come by. And so you see these stories, uh, they, they rely on rain, and they pray, and they say, God, you got to send rain, because if we don't get rain, we'll, we'll just all die. There's not, well, we'll, we'll send off. We'll build a pipeline to somewhere else. Like in our area, well, we're, we're running, uh, population keeps going up. We need to build a new reservoir to, to accommodate a greater need for water in North Texas. Well, they just say, well, God, God's either going to send the rain or we're just going to die. And so the rains fall. Well, the rains, they, they got to build up coming off the Mediterranean and it the rains fall on the, on the hills, the mountains, and all the way up in uh, the northern part of things, uh, Mount Hermon. It's snow-capped year-round and runoff from Mount Hermon. Uh, it, a lot of it runs off, flows underground, and then it pops up in springs all over uh, the land of Israel. And then there are springs. Those are the springs. that's mostly runoff from Mount Hermon. And then... Not a lot of rivers. You got the Jordan River and some streams that are dry most of the year. Uh, when it rains, they want to capture it. And so there's cisterns. So you read a lot about cisterns. They build underwater uh, containers where you could capture it. When the rain came, you wanted to get every drop of it. So they'd have a gutter system. It would run in, and then they could store the water so it wouldn't, wouldn't disappear. It's hard to come by. A lot of limestone, the, the water would seep out. So they had to construct these cisterns that would hold water and then the if you're if you're reading through your bible this year you may have already passed through the book of genesis in the book of genesis there's lots of stories about and then they dug a well and it's a big deal they found a well dug a well and water's there all the time because there weren't very many of them so when they found one it's it's noted in god's word we found a constant source of water a reliable consistent source of water one of my favorite passages in the Bible is the one where Jesus goes out of his way to meet a Samaritan woman at a well. And it's one of those wells mentioned in the Old Testament, one of those special places that the water's always there. It's a deep well. It's a reliable well. It's been there for centuries and centuries. And Jesus goes to, the, goes to this woman who's alone. We had a sermon about this a few weeks ago. Goes to a woman, uh, John 4, give me a drink. And we're actually not told whether or not she gave him a drink. But Jesus gave her a great word about living water, not water that just comes from a well and you're going to be thirsty again in a, just a little while. Certainly by the next day, 
But he says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give will never be thirsty again. And the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. What a great image of, of what the water is and what the water does. Listen, that image of water, drought is going to come to everybody. Spiritual drought, spiritual dry things going to touch all of us. Hard things are going to touch all of our lives. We're not told that if you follow Jesus, everything's always going to be easy, smooth, carefree, uh, happy-go-lucky. We're told that we'll never have to walk alone. We will never have to face those things alone when, when the water of life is our life. And so in those heat of life problems, we're just going to we're going to have flat tires on our cars and our computers are going to break down and we're going to struggle with the effects of aging or infertility or cancer, a prodigal child or married to a spouse that doesn't know the Lord, friends may abandon us, uh, marriage is tough, financial difficulties, lose a job, experience abuse. And the truth is, regardless of where we're planted, following the Lord exactly, they're going to be drop times, dry times. And the big question is, how do you respond to those times when they come? And you can try to manage it yourself, or you can turn to the one who said, I am the water of life, a well, uh, water welling up to eternal life. It's all a matter of where you look for your relief and where you look for your help and hope. Look to Jesus. Then... We find another simple example, simple words, simple vocabulary from John's gospel. And this, chapter 8, one of his great I am statements. Remember, there's seven I am statements in John's gospel. He form, forms up his argument, his presentation, that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, believing you might have life in his name. And in verse 12 of John 8, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. And we've said this several times, say it again today. That sounds fairly benign to us, but for, for every hearer in the first century, when he said, I am, they all knew he just crossed a line that they didn't think he should have crossed because he declared himself to be God. He used that special covenant name that God gave to Moses and when he said, I am, and that would have offended just a whole lot of people. That is why they killed him, because he claimed to be God. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So throughout the Bible, we get this contrast. And it, it shows up in literature all over, but it's certainly in the Bible. There's light and there's darkness. And you get that contrast. And the Bible uses those words to make a lot of insights about spiritual things, about the doctrine of salvation itself. In the Old Testament, God is pictured as light in Psalm 27, Psalm 36, Salvation is called light in Isaiah 9, and God is the creator of light, certainly, in Genesis 1. In the New Testament, light and darkness are contrasted to, to, to illustrate several things. Light and darkness are life and death. They are good and evil behavior, openness and secrecy, truth and falsehood. God's kingdom, the devil's kingdom, light, darkness. The Bible offers a lot of implications for living in the light. That living in the light with God means you're going to walk in truth, fellowship, love. And the question is always, why would you remain in the darkness when you don't have to? Why would you not step into the light when you have that opportunity? I, I read this news story and grabbed it a while back. It's a story about a woman named Rose Crawford. She was 50 years old. She went in to have this surgery on her eyes, which is what attracted me to the story because my eye, my eye troubles. Well, she's been completely blind her whole life, 50 years old. She goes in to have surgery. They're taking the bandages off, and for the first time in her 50 years, she sees light, she sees color, she sees form. Her vision has been restored, and she she's just weeps over, oh my goodness, this is so incredible. And, and you can imagine what this would be like for someone blind, completely blind for 50 years. But the rest of the story, after this, uh, it's an Ontario hospital where she has the surgery, that, and that's where the story comes from, that uh, 
the doctor is a part of this interview, and he says, we're so happy for her, excited for what she has. But, you know, one of the sad parts about her story is the surgical procedure that restored her sight has been around for 20 years now. She just assumed that nothing could be done. And someone, through you know, a series of circumstances, they say, I think we can fix this. She got in front of the right doctor, the right time. And, but but the, the story and what makes it really hard, you know, I, I mean, I feel, I, I feel for somebody's story like that is she spent 20 extra years in darkness that she did not have to be in darkness. I know a lot of people who... What are you waiting for to give your life to Jesus? What are you waiting for to, to begin walking in the light and stepping out of the darkness? And a lot of people, they spend a lot more time in darkness than they ever should. When in fact, uh, oh, Jesus is there all along. How different life could be. So, question. Are you tired of running into things in the darkness? Tripping over things in the darkness? Stepping on things in the darkness of your life? Jesus is the light of the world, and, and, and that includes your world, no matter how dark any day, any circumstance feels, seems. Now, back to chapter 7, verse 2. Now, the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. And here's why that's a big deal, because it's the context of everything Jesus just said. And it can be lost to us uh, because of uh, biblical backgrounds. So biblical backgrounds can be helpful. What you may not know is that at the Feast of Booths, and remember, the Feast of Booths is a celebration. God took care of the, the, the Israelites in the wilderness. While they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, God provided for them. God took care of them. God met their needs. And so the Feast of Booths, that, that's what it is about. And the way it worked, and it still works today, a lot of uh, uh, committed uh, Jewish people will, will celebrate the Feast of Booths to this day. They would create these temporary little camp-out sort of structures. I mean, cloth, four sides, and palm branches on top, but not too thick because they wanted to be able to see the stars. Also a part of the symbol of what's taking place. You know, today... Um, uh, com uh, Orthodox committed Jewish family they'll celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles Feast of Booths they'll construct this and they may go out and eat their meals in it as a family each day during the the week of the, the festival or they some will also spend the night and like we're going to camp out there to be reminded of what it was like traveling in the wilderness all these years uh, they'll, they'll they'll do this together in Israel, you look at uh, apartment complexes, and a lot of them are built with balconies. A more, lot more apartments than houses. They have balconies, and the balconies aren't like one on top of another on top of another because of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so they're, they're offset so that everybody from their balcony can build their booth and still see the stars at night. It's a fascinating little uh, architectural design that has to happen in the apartment complexes in Israel today. So, Moses instructed the people. The first and the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles were to be observed just like a Sabbath day. No extra work. It's a day of rest, a day of quiet, a day of focus. But the seventh day, was the great day, which is what John tells us here. It's the great day. It's the celebration day. And there's some things that happen, some traditions that were developed, some uh, ceremonies that take place on the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is how this rolls out. There's this parade. This is the first thing. There's a parade. And the priest would have two golden pitchers. One of them would have wine, the other empty, and they'd have this procession. And everybody wanted to be a part of it. It was a big, woohoo kind of celebration. And they would make their way to the pool of Siloam. You remember Jesus, uh, there, was a, there was a guy, a blind man. Jesus, you know, took water and made, made clay and put it on his eyes and then told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. 
And he came back. His vision was restored. Same pool of Siloam. The priest would take his pitcher, one with wine, one with water, golden pitchers, and he would make, do this procession. While he's going, the, uh, the people are singing. They're singing Psalm 118, which is just a big celebration. God is great, and God's wonderful, and all the things he has done and provided for us. So they're singing Psalm 118, and they had lots of flutes. And all the flutes are playing this song, backing everything up, and people are just hooping and hollering, and it's a it's a party all the way to the pool of Siloam. Then the priest, he gets to the pool, he fills the pitcher, and then they head back. Well, on their way back, you know, there are lots of gates around Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, and one of the, the gate that they would go through would be the water gate. Imagine that. They go through the water gate to reenter. They go into the temple complex. In, at the altar, there are two silver basins as a drink offering to the Lord. And the Old Testament talks about drink offerings. They pour the wine into one. The water from the pool of Siloam into the other. Still singing Psalm 118. Still celebrating. And, you know, that may not sound like a party to you, but it seemed to be back then there was uh, one ancient uh, Jewish rabbi who wrote this about that ceremony. Anyone who has not seen this water ceremony has never seen rejoicing in this life. It was something you just didn't want to miss out on. So all of that happens... And the ceremony to thank God for his provision of water in the wilderness, that in dry places God provided water. And it's a request, God, could you provide rain to, for our crops in the year to come? Because without that, uh, we're, we're lost. And again, we're used to turn on a tap and there's water, but not so in the Middle East, not in the first century. Sure enough, water was scarce. And they were aware, we have to depend on God for everything in a dry land. We have no hope apart from God's provision of water for us. And that's why the, the prophets in the Old Testament, they assign such high value to water as it is a symbol of salvation itself. Ezekiel wrote, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you'll no longer worship idols. Now the same sort of language we get when we talk about baptism today, that it's a, a symbol of our sin being washed away. Now, that's, that's the water. So we've given you some water. We've given you some waterfalls. We had the, the uh, in Getty is where the uh, waterfall picture was. We had, had on the big screen a while ago. And uh, in Getty, it's one of David's hideouts. And you're right up next to the Dead Sea. It is desert everywhere. And then you cut through the rocks, and all of a sudden, here's this oasis in the middle of everything. And uh, the waterfall, one of the springs. And that's just where it happens to drop down. Now, at the end of the first day of the feast, you get the next image. Because the end of the first day, they're going to illuminate the temple complex. And here's uh, one rendering of what it would have looked like. So what you have, that big area, that's called the court of the women in the temple complex. And you see the torches, there are four of them. And uh, probably not far off from that big because they were 75 feet tall, four of them. And they would have had four uh, branches from each one of these huge 75-foot tall pillars. And they would, it was a little complicated to do this logistically, but they would, they would put 10 gallons of oil, uh, by our measurement, in each one of those four branches. So you got 40 gallons of oil up there, then they'd fire it off. And so this thing's like the size of an Olympic torch in, in, kind of in, in its impact. And you have four of these. The, the Mount of Olives is higher than the temple complex. But once you get down into Jerusalem, the, the actual wall city of Jerusalem, this would have lit up things everywhere. Every neighborhood would have felt a little of the light of these big blowtorches. And uh, as a part of the ceremony for the Feast of Tabernacles, they lit these things off as a reminder that God led his people, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. They were reminded of the glory of God that descended as, as fire, the Shekinah glory of God on the tabernacle, later on the temple, and now 
the glory of God, the light of the world has returned to the temple complex because Jesus is there. And he is the light of the world. And Jesus, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so it's, it's during this incredible water ceremony that Jesus says, a well springing up, living water. And it's maybe next, that night then, in the court of the women, as the people have gathered in mass, some of them are carrying lamps as well to, to celebrate this. And he says, in that context, maybe standing next to one of those blowtorch uh, towers, I, as he says, he shouts, I am the light of the world. So, so how do you drink the water Jesus offered? How do you step into the light of Jesus Christ? It is so simple because the gospel is simple. Because it's by believing. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. And this is received by believing. In John's gospel, the worst sin you can commit is not believing. And the greatest act of obedience is always going to be believing, trusting, putting your faith in Christ. He alone can satisfy the dry places of your life, the drought seasons of life, because he's a spring of living water, flowing water, constant source of water from a well of the Spirit that never runs dry. And do you need that today? He brings you light in your darkest days to the darkest corners of, of our existence. Do you need some of that today? He's the water. He's the light. He's for you. Believe.